Well, hello, hockey fans, and welcome to a uh, special bonus feature on this week's Bison TV DVD. Of course, the game against the Peterborough Phantoms was a night where a Bison legend celebrated an absolutely remarkable achievement. His 400th league game for the club. This was a man at the end of the day who played in the Heineken League. He's played in the Super League. He's played in the British National League. He's played in the Elite League. And, of course, he's played in the EPL for the Bison. He's the only player to ever win the Benson and Hedges Cup plate three times. And he's also... A bit of a legend around here, it has to be said. At the end of the day, every trophy the Bison have won since 92-93 has seen the number 20 on their side as Tony Redman has been lining up for them. And earlier this week, before the game against Peterborough, I was very lucky enough to catch up with the Scottish superstar. And here's the interview that I conducted with him. Tony, 400 league games coming up against Peterborough. Obviously a, a great achievement for yourself. <laughs> Not well, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, it's... Uh... To be honest, it's it's another game, but it's it's something that I've get I've get great pride in uh, actually you know achieving um, four hundred league games. It does, not a lot of players would do that for one club. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward. To it. it must seem so far away now when you think back to your times in Glasgow growing up and sort of playing and learning your trade up there. Really, to think where you are now. Um, I I think the the concept of all of, all of our players in Glasgow and in Scotland in general. Um, our, our goal was to come to England, really, to to play, uh, because you could see the the setups of of all the clubs and how how differently it was run. Um, and to be fair, with the exception of you know Fife and Dundee and places like that. Um, you know, very professionally run, and it, there was a boom time, you know, around the early nineties where um, supposedly all the best players moved south. <laughs> so uh, I, I was fortunate enough to to be picked up and and you know made the move. And the year you made the move was obviously after you made play for GB under 18s as well as part of one of the growing generations really of that time, sort of Ashley Tate and David Longstaff and quite a few other sort of of the young players at that time that are still. Playing around today, really, compared to a lot of other guys. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, you know, th those guys have had fantastic careers as well, and um, you know, uh, fair play to them. They're they're still playing in you know top leagues, and each each person uh, situations change, and you know, family life and stuff like that. So it, you kind of make make decisions based on that, and what's best for you, and what's best for your family. So, but I mean, the the time that I've had. In England, playing hockey has been has been fantastic. When you first came down to Basingstoke, what were your your first impressions? Because obviously, you're coming down from it's quite a long way from home. Um, a young eighteen year old coming into it it wasn't too bad because um, my brother played the year before for Basingstoke, and the whole the whole story of me end, ending up coming here was the fact that um, I played for Glasgow against Basingstoke when I was sixteen years old, and um, I won a couple of man of the matches and scored a few goals against them and stuff. And um, my brother made the move that year. I think it was nineteen ninety one or whatever. Um, I then decided, well, decided I wasn't allowed to move because I was too young, <laughs> to be honest. Um, to stay in Glasgow, I stayed on at school and I, I played for Air in the Premier League, which helped me a lot because I got a hell of a lot of ice time and. You know, it helped me improve my game, and you know, my brother had had a hell of a lot to do with me moving down because he he was on at Peter Woods the whole year. If you're looking for a young British guy, you know, my brother's up there. Go and have a look at him, and um, you know, I owe him a lot in that respect. So, you know, Peter Woods came up and watched. Um, we were I was playing for air against Telford in the a playoff game, and. Um, you know, he took me out for dinner and stuff like that, and then after the season was finished, offered me a contract. And what seasons come down as well, because obviously it was the uh, the big the, the year that's still very much remembered by a lot of Basingstoke fans. The year of Division One winning and the playoffs as well, including the big game in Sheffield. Yeah, I mean the I think the the greatest memory for me looking back on something like that was uh, the fact, obviously, we had. Four fantastic uh, imports, and you know, Rick Ferrer, Kevin Conway, Mario Bologna, and Russ Perrant. And um, 
there just seemed to be a little bit of a not so much of an acknowledgement of the the British talent that we had because um, you know Sheffield had signed a lot of really good players the likes of Les Milley and guys like that and you know they were grabbing the headlines but when it came to it it was you know our, our British players that won that game I think Kevin Corey never played right. that yeah. that weekend and um, you know that that was the the most satisfying part of that victory yeah certainly and certainly the, the memory I sort of have of that time and sort of reading into it for today is sort of it was the real boom time of hockey Sheffield had the money left right and centre had a massive rink that they were filling every week with fans it must have been a a sort of exciting time really to be moving into British hockey because that wasn't even the top league at the time that was the one below it yeah I mean that that was it we were uh, we were both vying to uh, to get into the Premier League at that time um, that game that you, you're actually talking about it, that that was sold out for two or three weeks beforehand they had 9,000 fans there and uh, it was it was a phenomenal place to play I actually played the Saturday night before the game we played them on the Sunday we played the Saturday night um I played for Scotland against England, the fiftieth, uh, the fiftieth game, and thankfully won that as well. <laughs> Good weekend then, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure, it was a memorable weekend yeah. for certain. Um, obviously, also around this time, there was also the big changes in the league were coming in. It was decided that the Heineken League didn't really work out, and so guys wanted to push on and have the Super League. But in some ways, that may not have actually helped British players like yourself. Is it fair to say? I think. Um, to to be fair to British hockey, I think if you look at sport in general in Britain, um, they they seem to think that uh, if a guy has got a CV and he's possibly from you know Glasgow or Peterborough or Newcastle, and they've got a guy from Vancouver or Calgary or something, he's going to be better. Um, however, that that's not always the case. And I think, you know, that sometimes uh, clubs can be guilty of looking, looking beyond what they've got. And do you feel that, that maybe you fell foul of that? Because obviously you only had really one season in the Super League, you moved down into the BNL with Guildford. Do you feel that maybe you didn't have the opportunity to, to shine at the highest level that was available for you that at the time when you were really in the prime of your career that you should have had? Yeah, I mean, I, I had a great opportunity playing the, the Super League. I enjoyed my time there as well. Um, how that panned out wasn't the greatest thing uh, for me personally. Uh, I, I went to Slough that year. I had a great year, won a, won a trophy and stuff like that. Um, however, there, there was myself, it wasn't just me, there was myself and many other British players that, you know, fell by the wayside, as it were, in, in terms of the Super League. Um, the only satisfying thing for me was that the two British players that were loyal to the team then left. Um, and Basingstoke actually finished the a lower position the following year. But that, realistically, has got nothing to do with whether I was in the team or, you know, it's just one of those things. Let's look at more sort of happier signs at Basin Dug. Obviously, sort of the uh, the uh, beds and hedges plate final, the victory of that one. Obviously, the only player ever to win it three times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As you're desperately showing the fingers yeah, at me yeah. there, I do realise it is a, a three time winner that yeah. I have with me. But obviously, they were sort of seem to be happy memories of the club. Everybody from those periods talk about that mid night, the late nineties, early noughties as sort of the golden time for Basin. I, th- I think. Um through my whole time in business so it, it's definitely you know coming back especially with you know kind of jumping to the to now yeah. um there was a lot of concern about the reaction of uh dropping from the elite league um the same thing happened then and you know having experienced it and knowing the the core fans that are still coming you know were coming when I first got here and um, I had no doubt at, at that time that you know it was going to work and it did and it what it does is it it's, to me it, um, it brings there's a whole togetherness that you know the, the fans can connect with the players because they're not leaving every season um, and you know 
they get to know them and they're around for longer. So in that respect, it's it's a lot better, I think. Oh, definitely. Sort of, the sort of just the memories of it all from yeah. those times. It's sort of there's a much more togetherness like there is now with the team. Really, it's it, yeah. just everybody's in it, and it's, it's it feels like a club rather than sort of as you were with the elite league stars. You just look at them as a side. Yeah, I th- and that's the thing, and I think it's possibly the same throughout a lot of clubs that um, there's so much chopping and changing that um, you know sport don't get me wrong is very much you you can be classed as a name yeah. but um, and not an actual an actual person but I think it was the best for all parties that in both situations that the, the move was made to move leagues Let's talk about you personally because obviously when there was all these imports coming in there were a lot of British Canadians playing in the Team GB Chances for dare we say it, the the British players to actually play for their country were small, and mm. does that ever frustrate you? Do you ever sort of sit back and look back and think, I would have liked to have had more of an opportunity to walk <coughs> to wear the line? I think you know, um, I was involved uh, quite a few times, even with the senior team. Um, at the end of the day, <coughs> life's too short to worry about stuff like that. I think um, I don't look back in anger anymore at anything. Um, possibly at the time, yeah, I, I thought, you know, I can I can see it from both sides, but it still goes back to the scenario of um, looking beyond the, the passport, as it were. That's fair enough. I think, yeah. so look at, uh, it's, only, it's only fair to the other sides that you have played for. I mean, there's only very few sides that you have actually played for, and obviously... You all right there? Yeah, it's all right. My face is fuzzy in my pocket and making sure it's not you calling me. Do you know what I mean? We'll talk about Guildford, first of all, obviously. Um, the proverbial money bag club, it has to be said, and it must have been quite a nice experience playing at the Spectrum in what is quite a modern facility there and a well-set-up club, as everybody you know, would be. The, some sometimes through your career there can be uncertainty in with clubs and you know what league you're going to play in and stuff like that and you know I went that was a time where um, I was going through a stage where teams didn't think that I was ever going to be available because they just put just thought I was going to be in Basingstoke because that's the kind of person I am I don't don't move that often. Um, you know, I, I happened to I happened to speak to Stan, and um, you know he he signed me up as soon as he could. the The funny thing about that was, is you know, playing there it's such a a well run club, and that they're a great credit to to our sport in this country and how it, and how it's run. And um, but with that comes pressure to win trophies and everything like that. And thankfully, I did win <laughs> something there, which is good. And I've made. A lot of good friends there that, you know, are friends for life as opposed to, you know, just acquaintances. Yeah. So that's that's been really good. And we better talk about Slough as well. I mean, obviously, the end wasn't as perfect as it should have been, but there were some happy times you did have there. I, I mean, the, the playoff weekend, for instance, yeah. the playoff victory, for example, is part of probably one of the best EPL teams has ever been in terms of a natural side on the ice at the time. Yeah. I mean, I had a, a fantastic time at Slough, and I, I have. Get many good friends there as well, in the, in the same token as Guildford, and um, and that's the thing. It's the the friendships I've made are, are friendships that, that that go way far and beyond anything that happens on the ice. So. Exactly. Where do you see the future the future of British ice hockey? Because obviously, I mean, we we, for example, we have an elite league team going into uh, Glasgow this season, and we have an EPL that is looking strong, ish. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where do you see the future holding? Is it going to be more in going back towards the BNL days of a mixture of imports? Is it the Elite League model or is it the EPL model that seems to replicate a lot what the Heineken League was? I think it's it's forever changing, um, and I think that the arena teams uh, have they don't have an advantage. Don't get me wrong, but it. it, it kind of gives an unlevel playing field in the respect of, you know, support and what they can what they can market. Um and it's always it's always the way that as soon as you start pushing beyond limits that 
teams or clubs fall by the wayside. Um, I don't know what the ideal is. I don't think, but I, what I don't think is I don't think that twelve imports in a team is beneficial to the British team yeah. or British players in general, young kids coming through and stuff like that. I think you know sometimes they need to be able to see a guy that you know comes up through the ranks and makes it, as it were. Yeah. Where do you see your, where do you see yourself in the future of British ice hockey? Because obviously, I mean, sad fact is you're not getting any younger, um, and. Where do you see yourself? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just in terms of, like, obviously, <laughs> obviously, obviously, now you're the assistant coach at Basingstoke yeah. as well. Where do you see yourself sort of moving towards? Do you see yourself staying within the sport, within a coaching role? Do you see yourself? You know, uh, nothing would give me um, greater pleasure than to be able to help younger kids um, learn the sport and play the sport. Right. Um, and whether that means that eventually, whenever a, you know the time comes for me to stop playing, that I then possibly become a head coach, whatever that may be, you know, I would be looking at the junior setup quite a bit, to be honest. So that that's the kind of way that I would be looking at it if the opportunity ever arose. Sure, sure, there must be the opportunity somewhere within sport. You never know what you yeah, never know what could so, happen. Yeah, exactly. Top three moments in hockey, then. Throughout your career, what are your top three moments? You can have as much time as you want to think about this one. Say the first things that come into your head. <laughs> <coughs> Realistically, any time you win, win a trophy yeah. um, is, is the best feeling in the world. And I actually don't think that anything else tops that, so I don't think I could give you a top three in that respect. Just winning trophies. Well, winning, winning, tro <laughs> winning trophies... As a team, yeah, you know the I've been I've been very, very lucky and very honoured. I think in in the respect of the the amount of personal trophies that I've won, but I've I've never once looked at it and thought to myself, you know, oh well, yeah, well that's great. Well, I thought, oh, wow, you know, I've I've been more shocked than anything. Um, but the winning winning trophies as a team, the the camaraderie. <coughs> The builds, the memories that it builds. You know, you could, I could, I could bump into um, someone I haven't seen since we've won the playoffs in nineteen ninety three, and we could sit and talk about that, have a beer and talk about that, and remember those memories, and you, that never goes from you. And obviously, we're talking about camaraderie. We talk about playoffs. We got to just quickly look at this season and. Pretty much the return of hockey to Basingstoke has to be competitive hockey at least, where you've got a team on the ice that are winning games and it could be an interesting end to this season. I think, you know, the great thing about this season, and it's probably the best thing and the worst thing, is um, the amount of injuries we've had has, um, <clears throat> excuse me, is, is, is given, given us a, a false sense of where we're at. Um, we had a lot of big games during that time that, you know, if we'd have got on a run then, um, who knows where we'd be right now. But what it seemed to have done was, um, I think some some people kind of looked at it and thought, well, business will come that good. Bunch of dead wood, whatever. You know, <laughs> <laughs> choice of better world. Yeah, no. Which, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. The, but, you know, and I'm saying that purely as a joke. Yeah. Um, but in all seriousness, people look at it and, and they, they say, oh, well, business still can't do very well, you know, they, they're this or they're that, and they don't see the big picture of the fact that, you know, we, we've had so many guys out for eight, ten weeks. I mean, it's not even the fact that you're out for eight weeks. It takes you then a couple of weeks as a team to get fit, healthy, and back into the way that you're playing. And, you know, I've been been really really proud of our team and the way that we've played since you know <coughs> December January time um, and it's been fantastic they're a great 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 bunch of guys and uh, hopefully the memories that I was talking about earlier I'll have with those guys well obviously the big celebration will be a memory is obviously Saturday 400th league game for the club what do you have any sort of message just as we finish this for for the fans who throughout the years who have supported you at this rink and at many other rinks as well what other side of the barrier they are in terms of supporting which club 
hopefully we'll be having this conversation when we have my 500 <laughs> but um, no it's just to, to thank everyone for you know the support and the friendship um, that they've given my, not only myself now but my family you know it's been it's been fantastic and the people that I'm talking about they'll know who they are and um, they've been fantastic and I can only I couldn't thank them enough really Cheers, Tony. Thank, Thank you very much indeed. Cheers. Cheers, mate.